Please stand with me as we invite God's presence into this place. O God of the morning and of the evening hours, let your spirit come on us here gathered. This is the holy place where we, your people, call on you in faith, joining heart and voice in thanksgiving and praise to your name. Yes, Adonai, we want to praise you. You're the great God, the creator of all. And we just appreciate you. This day, in our bulletin, we have a number of special requests that need to be brought to you for your attention. And we just ask that your will be done in each case. Now again today. Thank you that we are here, that your Holy Spirit is with us, that you're going to speak to them, to our hearts, through the speakers. We just adore you, Lord. We're so thankful for you. And we just ask that this day, your name be glorified in our worship. For Jesus' sake, amen.
Good morning. Before we sing our first anthem today, I would like to welcome a special guest who's with us today. The composer who uh, composed most of the music you're going to be hearing today, Dr. Gwyneth Walker. Welcome. Dr. Walker. <laughs> Dr. Walker is visiting from the East Coast, and you can read a lot of wonderful things about her, uh, her creative outputs in the, bul in, in the bulletin. Uh, and she's been here since Wednesday where she visited my uh, students at Cal State Los Angeles. We also hosted yesterday here at church a high school festival choir. We had over 200 singers in the space singing her works and having a chance for the students to work with her. So we had a wonderful three days filled with passion and a lot of singing and we're quite proud to have her with us today and sing her music. So welcome again, Dr. Walker.
it off. Whoa. Hi. So when the lights go off and it gets dark, do you get sometimes scared? No. You guys don't get scared of the dark? No. You guys are so, you do? Have you ever been home with your mommy and daddy? And then it's so nice and the lights are on and you might even be watching TV and everything is so bright. And then all of a sudden at nighttime, have the lights ever gone off on you? We had an experience like that. Remember, Caitlin? Yes, we were at home at nighttime. And Daddy was gone, that's right. And the, the lights just went off. We were wandering around. And we were wandering around, yes. And she was a little bit scared until we found a flashlight. And then she wasn't so scared anymore. Even though you guys are really, really brave and you're not afraid of the dark, do you know that some people are afraid of the dark? They don't like to be in the dark. Yes, Eliana? You're afraid of the dark? Do you know what? You are too? It's OK. Do you know what? When Jesus was here on the earth and he was talking with all of his friends, do you know that Jesus was like a bright light when he was talking to his friends? When he was around them, everything was bright and sunny and wonderful. And then when Jesus died and went to heaven, it looked like this for some of them. It was a really dark time because Jesus wasn't there anymore. They didn't know what to do. Some of them were even a little bit scared. Some of them had maybe some doubts in their mind. They didn't have to go away, they didn't have to go away though. Do you know what happened, though? Jesus promised that no matter where he is, he's like a really bright light. And it doesn't matter how dark it seems in our lives, Jesus always promises to be the light in our life. That's right. And Jesus, when he left, he gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was like a bright light, like this flashlight. And it came into every person. That Holy Spirit came into people and everyone became really bright, like flashlight even, almost to like light up the whole church. Can we light the church? <laughs> And do you know what? Jesus wants us to be just like flashlights. He wants us to be a really bright light so that each one of us, when our lights are on, the whole church becomes brighter. Because do you know what? For some people, even though the lights are on, it's really dark for them. They may be in a place where they're really sad. And when you're really sad, it feels dark. And some of them are really doubting. And when you're doubting, it feels dark too. And do you know what? Jesus wants us to be like flashlights. Jesus wants us to put light in people's life. And so that even when they're feeling at their darkest, we can be like, oh, here's some light for you. And they'll be like, oh, thank you so much. Because he wants us to be so light like he was light. And so we have to remember that even when things are dark, God can be like our flashlight because he's always there. And God wants us to be like flashlights too. Yeah, they're sad and they doubt, and we could be lights, right? And so let's all try to be lights for Jesus today. You want to be a light for Jesus? I think we can be. Yes, Shaley. It's like when we're happy, we feel light and happy, and when we're sad, we feel like we're dark. That's right. When we're happy, we feel light, and when we're sad, we feel dark. But Jesus wants us all to be lights, lights and so that people around us can be happy and that they can come out of their darkness because we help them. And so I want you to all be like flashlights today. And to right now, we're going to go downstairs, and we're going to be more learn more about Jesus and how we can be lights in godly play. But before we go, we're going to pray. So will you bow your heads for me while we pray? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that your light came to shine brightness into all of our dark areas. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us the ability to be lights for other people. Help us, Lord, to shine brightly for you. In your name we pray, amen. Let's go downstairs for godly play.
I invite you to join us as we read the scripture for today. It is taken from the first chapter of the second book of Peter. You will find it printed on the inside of your bulletin. Kira and I will read the light print. We invite you to join us on the bold print. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we were told you, when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Dr. Walker, thank you for being with us today. Um, your music has, has stirred my soul already this morning. Thank you so much for being with us. And a choir, Sebastian Kemp, for uh, what you have done to take what she heard in her mind and to now let us hear it. Uh, thank you that we can trust you to bring the beauty of that to life. It's been a blessing to listen to you this morning, so thank you. My family realized something last night. Two and a half years ago, we moved from Atlanta, Georgia to Los Angeles. And last night, we realized that we are now truly Californians. We realize this because we are now terrified of rain. Robin grew up in Louisiana. I spent much of my life in Georgia, and she and I spent many of our early years of marriage in Georgia together, where it rains very hard, very often, accompanied by thunder, and sometimes hail. And it never bothered us unless a possibility of tornado was attached to it. But otherwise, it was another day in Georgia to have it raining cats and dogs. Yesterday, we did not want to drive. We live on a hillside, and we're looking to see if the ground seems to be shifting at all, and we're going to be covered in mud. So we just wanted to huddle and sit by the fire and pray for the rain to end. We have become Californians, so I just thought you should know that. Today, our story that we're going to look at from the gospel is a story of a momentary transformation it is the story of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And let me share with you that story from Matthew 17. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up, led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured. The, the Greek word is metamorphosis. Jesus went through a metamorphosis before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and, the cloud, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This amazing moment. Have you had these moments in your life? Have you had that time when the glory of God revealed itself to you? Where 
where it was like you were confused, you were discouraged, you didn't know what to do, and all of a sudden it was like a light shone forth and everything came clear and made sense and you felt the presence, the comfort, the peace of God in your life in a profound way. Have you ever had that moment where you say, you know, I don't think it was audible, but it was like I actually heard God's voice speak to me, and I needed to hear that right then and there. It changed my life. It, it made me know everything was going to be okay because I heard God's voice. Did you have that moment where something that you can't explain, you just cannot explain it happened, it was miraculous, and you, you can't brush it away as coincidence. You can't turn it in just to a common occurrence. Truly something miraculous happened in that moment. I've had those moments in my life. My junior year of high school, now, as you all know, I'm a good Christian boy, raised in a good Christian home. And, no, seriously, I was. Um... And so I went to Christian school. And so at my Christian school, every year at the beginning of the year, we would take a weekend and do a spiritual retreat to kind of start the year off right, help all the kids really focus in on God as we got off to the new year. And so we would go down to this camp down in Alabama called Camp Alamisco. Camp Alamisco, beautiful, kind of on a hillside, covered in pines, overlooking a lake, um, just spectacular. And I was part of the student leadership, part of the student association, and we had gotten together and had been praying every day for the last three weeks before we went to this retreat, really praying that God would really do something powerful in our midst and something transformative would take place at that weekend at the spiritual retreat. And so we drove down bouncing along in buses and vans and got to the camp and spent the day swimming, skiing, doing all sorts of fun stuff outdoors. And then as it got to Friday evening and we were entering our time of Sabbath that we gathered together at this outdoor amphitheater that faced directly west on the lake and you, you could watch the sunset go down right in front of you and there was a cross at the front of the amphitheater. It was just a magnificent scene overlooking the lake. And I will tell you, I cannot explain it. I don't remember the music. I don't remember what the pastor said that night. All I remember is that there was a time given towards the end of the service where students could get up and start sharing what they had experienced of God in their lives. And I can't explain it because there's no way to explain it. I'm a very shy person. And, and I still am a very shy person, and you don't believe me because I'm standing up in front of you now, and you think, therefore, I'm not a shy person. I'm a terribly shy person. And I was even more so when I was a junior in high school. And the last thing I would ever want to do would be to get up in front of a group of people and talk. Something happened that evening where I literally felt electricity pulsing through my body. And almost outside of myself, I stood up and went to the front, and I started speaking, and I had no idea what I was saying, but I was speaking words that, that what I was told later touched many students' lives, and that people told me later, they said, we, had, we don't know who you are and where you came from, Todd, but something happened in you that night, and what you shared really changed things. That whole weekend was powerful, it was magnificent, and my life changed. It was, I knew God was real. God was true in my life. I had never felt the presence of God so powerfully. One night at another point, we had a, a thing where we'd have a guest speaker coming for a week at school and would, would speak to us for a week. We called it week of prayer. I don't know why we called it week of prayer because it was just a week of sermons. There really wasn't much more praying, but we, I guess it sounds better to call it a week of prayer than a week of sermons. Um, and and this, this pastor, Pastor Ricks, I still remember him, spoke every week, would come into our Bible class and talk to us there. 
I've never met the man before, only saw him once or twice since then. He didn't know me, I didn't know him. He came up to me at the end of the week after our last worship together, and he said, I don't know you, but God has his hand on you, and he's going to do something special in your life. Blew me away. It stuck with me. I go back to those moments, and I say it was there where I sensed that God was calling me to be a pastor, that God wanted me to follow him in that way. You've had moments like that, most of you. You've had moments where God was real to you. God was present. God showed up in your life. God touched you. God spoke to you. You've had that. It's been years since I've told that story about myself. How long has it been since you've thought about those moments when God was real to you? How long has it been since you've told your kids, told your spouse, told your friends about those moments when God really showed up in your life, where God was tangible, almost tangible in your life? When we read this story of Jesus' transfiguration in Matthew 17, Matthew has written 60, 70, 80 years after this event. And Matthew and the other gospel writers felt compelled to write down this story, this moment when Jesus went from being just a common man, another guy in a robe and sandals, to being this being of light, seeming to float up in the sky and to be visited by two of the most prophetic and huge figures of Jewish history, and this, this magnificent moment where divine met human and, and everything changed. It had been 70 years since that story had been told, or had been recorded at least. Why write this story? I wonder if maybe those who were considered themselves the early followers of Jesus, who called themselves the church of Jesus, were not having those very tangible experiences with God anymore. I wonder if this profound, miraculous moments were fewer and far between, that that. The Spirit's voice was not as, as loud in their ears. That the initial energy and electricity that drove them forward to do what they were doing was now starting to wane. And the triumphs and the victories that they were expecting to happen because of Jesus, because of the power of the Spirit at work in the world, didn't seem to be taking And I wonder if now some of the followers of Jesus, some of those of the church, were starting to wonder, maybe what I thought was real wasn't. Maybe it was a dream. Maybe... I wasn't there. Maybe that person is just making it up. Maybe it's just a story. Maybe that person was psychologically a bit unbalanced, and so something happened in their mind where they thought it happened, and it really didn't. Maybe I was just young and naive. I can tell you that in the early years following those experiences in high school and some of the experiences I had in college, I never doubted God's hand in my life. I never doubted that God called me to be a pastor. Never doubted it. But I can tell you, a few years later, I've started to doubt 
the call of God in my life. And I've started to look back at those earlier experiences and say, you know what? Junior year in high school, 17 years old, there is so much hormone stuff going on. There is so much emotional stuff that goes on when you're a teenager, you know, and it's, it's just everything. I mean, I don't, I don't know, you know, what is, what is real and what's in my head, and girls were wrapped up in that too, and I mean, it's just, yeah, I remember one of those moments is holding one of the girls' hands while we were praying, and I don't know whether that was a spiritual moment or I was hoping that, that was going to go somewhere between us. And maybe that week of prayer speaker, maybe he just does that, and he thinks it's kind of a neat thing to do. He'll find a couple students every time he goes and talks to them and says, God's hand, because he knows the power that a, a respected man of God has, that a, that a, that a, a, a student's mind could be shaped by that, and it could have an impact. So maybe, <sighs> I've doubted those experiences. And maybe they're not real. Maybe I just wanted them to be real. Have you doubted those real experiences with God? Have you said, I was young and immature, or my theology hadn't developed to where it is now. I understand things. I didn't have a scientific mind. Now I have a scientific mind. Do you say, well, those type of things happen in a culture where you believe those things will happen, and so you start to see things that aren't really there because you want them to be true, but they're not really true. Maybe... That didn't actually happen. Maybe I didn't sense the presence of God. Maybe God didn't show up because God is not showing up tangibly now. I haven't heard God's voice in years. The light of God has not shown. I have not seen the miraculous. I don't see God anywhere. So maybe because I'm not seeing the tangible God now, maybe there was no tangible God then. And I wonder if the early church was exactly going through that. And so the gospel writers sit down and they say, I want to tell you the story. And I can tell you that I was there when the story happened. Or I can tell you that one of my colleagues, one of my friends, one of my relatives was there and they saw that event and they can tell you it's true. Don't dismiss this as a myth. It happened. Don't deny that God worked in the past. He did. Don't give up that God isn't here now because God was there then. There is a God. God is real. What Jesus said and did and taught and accomplished did happen. Don't give up on it. Wouldn't it be nice if we could constantly experience God's tangible presence in our lives? To hear his voice speaking to us regularly, to have moments where you're not sure what to do and the light shines and everything makes sense. That when you pray, you get an answer. I wish God was like that. And I've listened to a lot of sermons and read a lot of books by people telling me how I can have that. And you have too. Because if you've grown up in the faith, if you've spent any amount of time as a Christian, you've been a part of this because you wanted the light, you wanted the clarity, you wanted the voice, you wanted the direction, you wanted everything to make sense. You wanted life to be good. That's why you're here, and you want it good now, and you want it good for eternity. That's why we're here. 
And to every one of us, I would wager and come up and tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, not right now, that would be disrupting. But afterwards, tell me, and then I'll make. Then you come up, and we'll, we'll talk about it next week, and I'll have you share. But to every, I would guess to every person in the room, you've been disappointed. You've been heartbroken. You've been angry. And you've wondered if all this stuff that you thought was real was just a bunch of bunk. And yet you and I are still here hoping that it's not, but wondering if it is. And maybe at this point you don't know what else to do, and so you're hanging on because this is your best shot. I am wondering now if God has expected us or, or God, that God wanted us to expect that if we chose to follow Jesus, that we would always be in the light, that everything would always be clear and we would always know what to do, that that's what God intended. I wonder if that's what God wanted, and I'm starting to think it's not. My proposal to you today is this. That maybe God has shown his light into our lives at certain moments. so that we would know he was there, but that he shines his light and that light actually casts a long shadow. And that as we become convinced early on of God's presence because of the light, we then decide to follow Jesus into the shadow. You notice what Peter did when they were up on that mountain and Jesus was in his glory and Moses and Elijah are there and there's this and the voice of God is speaking. He says, Let's let's stay right here. Let's build, let's build a house, or let's pitch tents so that Elijah can stay here, Moses can stay here, Jesus can stay here, and we can stay here in this glorious moment where we know you're real, you're divine, everything is here. Let's stay here. And then in that moment of blinding glory and the voice of God and, and the, 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 the three disciples' eyes are closed in a mix of fear and reverence, all of a sudden they get a tap on their shoulder and they look up and it's Jesus and he's by himself. And Moses and Elijah are gone, the light's dimmed, there's no voice of God, and Jesus said, it's time to go. And they go back down the hill. And they walk out of the bright light of the mountaintop into the shadows of the valley. And look at what the first thing happens when they get down down off the mountain into the valley. In verse 14 of Matthew 17, it says, When they came to the crowd, a man came to him, knelt before him, and said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is possessed by a demon. Some translators, theologians, suggest that the language points to maybe this boy had epilepsy. And he suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was cured instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. These three disciples wanted to stay up on top of the mountain where everything was right and beautiful and everything made sense and was clear. But Jesus says, no, we go back down into the valley. And as soon as they get back down into the valley, 
all of a sudden they realize everything is not all fine and good. The world is still messed up. Things are still torn apart. There is this boy who is suffering from epilepsy, who is having something horribly wrong going on with his mind, and, and he needs to be released from the torment of this. And they can't release him from the torment. Jesus comes down and he releases the boy from the torment and he says, listen, this is our work. This is what we are called to do. That's why we can't stay up in the mountain. We can't stay up where everything is clear. We've got to go down into the shadows and we've got to make these things right. And we can't avoid these things. We can't run from these things. We can't run from people and have our world all honky-dory in our little box. We have to go back in and make things right. He says, it's time, you've seen me on the mountain, you've seen my glory. Hold on to that and follow me into the shadow. Here's the thing, if you stay up on the mountain, I'm not there. I'm down in the shadows. If you want to stay with me, you follow me into the shadows. You follow me where things don't make sense. You follow me where things are a mess. You follow me where evil still reigns and works. You follow me where people still get sick, where lives still are torn apart by relationship disasters. You follow me where there are poor people and hungry people and starving people and people who are left out in the cold, who are not welcomed into the community. You follow me down there, and that's where I'm at. It's not clear, it's not organized, it doesn't make sense, it's not comfortable, it's not easy, but that's where I am. If you want to be with me, I am not going to be in the light. I'm in the shadow. And I'm calling you to take just a little bit of faith that I'm there, even though you can't see me like you saw me in the light, I'm there working in the shadows. And I'm just as present there as I was up in the light. I've shared this with you before. You've heard it before. You would think Mother Teresa would always be experiencing the light of God. What a saintly, godly woman. There's been some reporting lately that suggests maybe there's a more nuanced understanding of Mother Teresa than maybe what's been told in the past. But for most of us, she served as a great inspiration throughout our lives, as a woman who's poured out her life to serve the poorest of the poor. You would expect a woman like her to be constantly experiencing the light of God. And yet for over half her life, she said in her diary, she felt no presence of God in her life. And yet, she stayed in the shadows because she believed that even though she couldn't sense God's presence, she was convinced that God was in the shadows. The Christianity that sells you a God that's always in the light and is wanting to bring you into the light so that your life is constantly in the light is a Christianity that is selling you a bill of goods. The story of Jesus Christ is he went from the light of heaven to the darkness of this world. He went from a glorious angel singing in the skies over Bethlehem to being born in a manger. He went from marching through the streets of Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, and being celebrated as king of kings, to being mocked and ridiculed by that same crowd and being taken to a cross. The story of God, and therefore our story, is the call to move and follow Jesus into the shadows because that's where Jesus is. And here's the other thing. You are called to move into the shadows with Jesus 
because you just might be the light of God to somebody else in the shadows. You might be the one that for another person, things came clear because of you. You may be the one who showed up out of the blue, they can't explain it away by coincidence or anything else. You were literally their miracle in that moment. That in your words of advice, of wisdom, of comfort, that you were the voice of God. If you stay in the light, you keep yourself from being light to someone else in the shadows. You are like the Moses who went up to visit with God, and after he came down from that mountain, because he had been in the light of God, his light still shone with the glory of God. And, and people said, you are God's presence. Your light is shining. We can't take it. It's so bright. He was reflecting the glory of God. You, when you leave those moments of clarity where God was clear and alive and powerful in your life, you now reflect that as you move into the shadows. You're the light bearer. You're the light keeper. You are the ones who bring what was real to you into the reality of someone else's life. The scripture that the Quishenberries read a moment ago. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. And then Peter's advice to you and me. You will do well to be attentive to the truth of this story of Jesus' metamorphosis. And it would, be, it would do you well to be attentive to your own moments of glory, of experiencing the presence of God, to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. I can't promise you and I can't offer you the ongoing light of God's presence. What I can offer you and encourage you with is that when you chose to follow Jesus out of the light, he's still with you in the shadows. And what I can encourage you to, encourage you to be today is that you would remember that you are carrying the light of God as you move and work in the shadows. Own that, embrace that, and follow your calling to be the light of God in a dark place. May you experience the reality, and may you be the reality of God in the shadows of this world. Amen. I want to talk to you about a couple things as we prepare to take our offering this morning. In the fall, we talked with you regularly about the, the idea of making the commitment to if you were in the position to do so, to increase your giving to the church by 1%, or maybe just add $5 a week to what you're giving because of the mission that we were undertaking, the things that we were wanting to do in 2014. And I want to tell you, in January and February so far, you have responded to that call profoundly. We are off to a great start because you've chosen to be faithful, because you've risen to the challenge. We are off to a great start, and I want to thank you for that commitment. I want to thank you for believing in the mission of what this church is trying to do. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. We are able to look and continue to move forward with what, you're do what we're doing because you've been very generous in your giving. If, if you have been wanting to and haven't set up the way, set up a plan of how to give, maybe you're not aware of, but you could set up a, a giving plan through our website. We have an online giving where you could every month go to the online page when you get your check, when you see your check enter into your bank account, when you go to the website to check what's going on. You could then right then go over to our website 
and put what you're planning to give right into our right, give it right then. You don't have to wait to put it into the uh, offering uh, satchels. Is that what they're called? Satchels? I don't know. Um, those little money bags. Money bags sounds <laughs> irreverent in some way. Um, those. Anyway, those those. Those velvet receptacles of God, <laughs> um, whatever we call those. Um, it's just as spiritual to make a few mouse clicks and to give it online. And so if, if that would be helpful to you, I want to encourage you to take a moment, go to the website, and, and consider giving online. It's a way of systematically setting it up. My wife and I um, work through our bank. Sometimes we use the website. Sometimes we have a check cut from our bank and mail to the church. It's one way or the other we do that. Um, it, it's helpful. Um, and then just two things I want to also mention to you, two needs that we have that you can give that are not financial gifts, but, but gifts of energy and time. Um, our greeting team, which you'll notice this morning, we had a great team of people in the courtyard at the doors as you entered in to greet you, welcome you, help you find your way around the church. Um, we're still looking for four or five more people who could join that team so that nobody has to give more than once a month. They can do that once a month. The rest of the time they can sit in the pews and worship with the rest of you. If you would be willing to give one Saturday a month, um, and there are four or five people, you can visit Leela Leong. She, Leela, stand up. You're, you, you love attention. No, she doesn't. She hates this. But stand up for just one second. Leela's right up there at the front. Let her know if you would like to join the team. She could really use your help. And then the other thing that I want to draw your attention to is um, our online campus has 50 or 60 people worshiping at the scheduled times that we have our online worship service. But our sermons and worship services since we launched have been viewed at least a thousand times um, by, different, by a thousand different people since we launched our online campus. We have a lot of people engaging with our church online. And one of the things that we need help with is that you would be, we would have somebody who would be a host and would greet people as they worship with us online at our Wednesday night service, our Friday night service, or our Sabbath service, that you would be willing to be there and just say, hi, welcome, we're glad you're here. Um, Pastor Leif can tell you all about it. You know who Pastor Leif is. Find him afterwards today. Let him know that you'd be willing to do it once a week, once a month, just an hour of your time to help connect people. We, we're, we're doing this online campus not just so people can just click on a button whenever they want by themselves to watch a sermon or to listen to music. We're wanting to create an actual worshiping community on Wednesday night, on Friday night, on Saturday morning. And so to be able to interact with the people who attend at those times is very important. So you may be an introvert who doesn't like to say a word to anybody when you're here on Saturday morning but you are a Facebook talker and you, you're the most extroverted Facebook or Twitter person, this is your ministry to be a warm, welcoming person online to our online campus. Please talk to Pastor Leif about that and let him know that you're willing to help. With that said, thank you again for all that you do with your ministry, with your financial support. Let's pray. Father, you've given us so much. You've done so much in our lives. We give back today. We give back financially, saying thank you. We give back with our time, saying we will serve you, we will serve others, because you have served us. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you will do. Thank you for being with us in the shadows. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside quiet waters. He refreshes our souls. He guides us along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though we walk through the darkest valley, we will fear no evil, for he is with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil. Our cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. On the mountain in the valley, your God is with you, and he will lead you all the days of your lives. Go in that peace today. Amen.